I'll probably lighten it right behind the text just to make sure that, mm -hmm. you know, just to raise it a little bit. Do you bit. do that with a layer mask? I, what I'll do is I'll just put another layer on and paint white mm -hmm. so that I don't destroy the texture underneath. You can uh, also do that with a layer, ma layer mask. Everyone, uh, that's know, always everyone's saying, answer. Is there's saying. a fancier way to do it, Will Terry? No, I'm just saying. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. We've all illustrated for all the major publications in the business. We've all taught art school at universities. And together we have somewhere around 75 books, children's books that we've published. That is right. Each week we answer different listener questions, trying to give you the best advice we can on the illustration field and business and art and how to do it, how to make a living at it. <laughs> Not taking, <laughs> taking Jake's line. <laughs> anyway, sometimes, sometimes we agree, sometimes we argue, but each time you're going to learn something brand spanking new. Brand spanking new. What, what, are, you, what are you laughing at? He started I just, doing I my line. I got into, into Jake's line. <laughs> Like, teach we you teach how about to, uh, illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. And then you would say, I'm Lee White. And I'd be like, uh, I'm Jake Parker. And then Will would do his again. Why don't we just start <laughs> the podcast loop. to just start talking to people and just say, this is, this podcast is different. We just start talking to you instead of, because the people that listen all the time, they're like hitting the 15 second forward button. I'm, well, well, here's the thing. You got to do, do it. Everybody loves Every it. episode is someone's first episode. Yeah, but those people can also go, hi, this is this is interesting. They didn't have an opening. I'm going well, to start listening to this. What we could do is just record an opening and it just I, plays. I, I, I like maybe, the individual opening. I do like that, but maybe we truncate it a little bit. Okay. So we just, uh, you know, hello, welcome to Three Point Perspective. Podcast about illustration, how to do it, Will, how to make a living at it, Lee, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. Boom. And then we can get right yeah. into it. And if you want to know who we are, you can look at our websites. Well, that's going like, too long. Who the heck are these guys? And and what makes them feel like they can talk about this subject? I'm going to go look at their website. Oh, Maybe we need to actually, actually go listen to some other illustration podcasts and see <laughs> see what, what other people I are doing. I think we don't need, even need to worry about it. Let's just keep doing our intro. No one cares. Yeah, no I, one cares. doesn't make a difference. No one, see, this is what no we do cares. at SVS. We will spend a week on this. And then, and then keep no it one, the no same. <laughs> yeah. No one cares. It's not going to be simple. Like how we, we we'll had this... Money. Uh, <laughs> we had Yes. We had this uh, entire, like... For months, we were worried about the name SVS, and we're like, well, it, it's so easy to mess up. How do you remember it? People always do SVA. And so we, we like brainstorm for new company name ideas. And then we're like, well, we can't trust ourselves because we're like, we're so far up into it. We need to like get an outside opinion. So we hired on consultants. They did a great job. They worked for like, they gave us this questionnaire and we all, everybody on the team, you know, answered it. They come back and they're like, okay, here's, you know, they did like weeks of research and they come back and they're like, here's your options. And the option we picked was changing it from um, keeping svslearn.com and changing it from Society of Visual Storytelling to School of Visual Storytelling. <laughs> and that was, that was the entire change. Which we wanted to call it from the very beginning. Yeah. But we didn't know if legally we could do it. Um, they did a, they did a good job, school. though, because just like anybody trying to get a critique, when somebody says, hey, no, this is a good one. Yeah. Essentially, their something. their thing was, you guys don't need to change anything. It's good. But if you right. really want to change it, here's just some other options. Right. And then we wrote them a big check. <laughs> and then we wrote well, them a check. But one of, the, one, of the, <laughs> one of the problems with changing it wasn't just changing the name. It was changing every social media account, all of our branding on all of our videos on every piece of mm -hmm. everything that, that we made or sent out, um, all of our yeah, documentation. The, the, advice, just, the advice here is... Think carefully when you start a business about the name because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. changing it later is very difficult. Well, yeah. and then the other side of that advice is it doesn't matter what you pick because the name isn't your brand. Your brand is how you yeah. serve people 
and your uh, interactions with them and your name and your logo and all that stuff is just like a flag. You know, it's not the, the pro- thing itself. And, you know, and I think I was part of the problem in want, really wanting a different name because I got tired of like trying to tell people. But mm-hmm. what I realized too is like when I tell people it's SVS Learn, they're like, SV, what? What was that again? SVD, SVC, yeah. SVA, you know. And then I, what I realized is those those aren't people that um, were ever going to even care about what we did anyway, other than just like someone I'm playing pickleball with, you know. Mm-hmm. Right. They're not even going to. Yeah. They're not they like wondering how to improve their art. Right. How to make a living at it. <laughs> yeah. Or to... They don't even care about making an impact in the world with, <laughs> with, with their art. <laughs> I'm going to try to bring your intro into this podcast as many times as possible. All right. Well, let's look at our first question today from, let's get to episode 130 questions. Can you believe it? This is episode 130. Wow. I've done 130 of these things. I, I actually can believe it. Yeah, I guess we do this every week. <laughs> if you keep doing For it. For the it's... past four years. <laughs> Uh, okay, for uh, this is, comes from in from Samantha. Subject line: Why do illustration agencies tell me I'm talented and then reject me? So, hello, Will, Lee, and Jake. Firstly, you guys are honestly the best artist podcast out there. I Woo. appreciate that. Boom. We really do. Thank you. We we try to do a good job. Your chemistry is amazing. You're you are warm, honest, and knowledgeable. Thank you for everything you do for us as aspiring uh, illust- artists. Uh, my goal is to be a children's book illustrator. It does not have to be full-time. I would be happy to publish one picture book a year. I've always had the impression that the best route to get into the picture book industry is to be uh, to get hired and represented by an illustration agency. I've submitted my portfolio to multiple agencies who focus on children's book illustration and have been rejected a few times, but the rejections are so confusing. And and maybe this sounds familiar to you listening. The agency told me that while I'm clearly a talented artist, they're currently not taking on any more artists. But when they continuously feature newly acquired illustrators on their social media, um, do I actually have talent or is uh, is, is this their polite way of rejecting me? I know that I still have a long way to go developing my skills. So I'm very open to critique. Thank you so much, Samantha. So yeah, so it's like, hey, you're talented. You're good. We're not taking on other artists. She sees other artists joining all the time. What's going on here? What do you guys it think? It is so hard to tell someone, hey, I don't like your work enough to take you on. It's, it's very difficult for people to be that direct. It's mm-hmm. easier for them to say... Oh, you know, we're not taking on any more artists right now. But and do you think that's really what they're doing here? Yeah, I think they are. No. But you don't think they're rejecting? Have you? Have you? Are you looking at her art? I'm looking at the art right now. Um, I think they in this. I, I agree with you that that happens, of course, because you don't want to let down people lightly and not hurt people's mm-hmm. feelings and stuff. But in this particular case, I agree with what they're saying. She is. She's right there. Um, what it's do you mean? just. She's right there at being probably representable by uh-huh. an agent. A smart agent would probably take this person on and mm-hmm. work with them for a year. And this person could be really good. She can draw well. She can paint well. It's a good style. Um, feels feels current. Um, yeah. That said, it's a little bit amateur in how much black she uses. And it's weird to, to say. Just, just, yeah. It's weird to say that because some people use black is a tough color to use or, or tough value slash color to use. And when people do it really well, like John Classen's work on Coraline, it's amazing. And mm-hmm. he's using blacks really well. Um, Tadahiro. Um, how do you say his last name, Jake? Uh, Tsugi. Yeah, Satugi, Tsugi, something like that. Yes, okay. Anyway, he's, he uses yeah. black. Fantastic. Um, mm-hmm. Bart Forbes, like all these illustrators, you know how to use black. In this case, it looks like she's using black as a crutch and doesn't know how to use color. Like mm. Will Terry, Will Terry uses color in a fantastic way as wow, a thanks. replacement for black. Yeah. I, I see the work as, um, uh, as really good, but, um, it, let's say, I mean, just reverse the whole thing. I'm, I'm a represent, I'm a representative, you know, mm-hmm. I'm a, I'm an agent and, um, I have access to the the best artists in the world online. 
right now, you know, and, and I have, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to assume that there are better people that are approaching this, this rep where there's less work that needs to be done to, to bring this artwork up to the next level. It's really good. And this is the hard place to be when your work is really good, but it's not really great. Um, mm. I, I would compare this, um, work to Julia Sarda's. Mm -hmm. Um, if you, if you look at, look at her work. Um, so if but, you, it, but not the highest high quality, right? No, no, no. It's I'm Julia saying the, 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 the style, but, it, but that's the thing. So if I look at Julia Sarda's work, the design is so good. And by that, I mean, um, you know, the, the silhouettes are much better. You're, you're talking about when you, Jake when, or Lee, when you say doesn't know how to use black that well, yeah, she's got a lot of black on black, a lot of dark on dark that doesn't isn't helping her. Um, I'm talking about Sam's work. Um, yeah, how, how do you Julia spell Sarda? Julie's last She name. knows uh, S A R D A. Yeah, Julia Sarda. Mm -hmm. She knows how to use black. If you go to her website, yeah, she's got black all over the place. But it's done in a mm. way that anchors shape and anchors design. It's not a it's not a crutch in in a replacement of of color. Right. I'm and just so, gonna screen share really quick. She's so good. Julia Sarda is amazing. There's a bunch of illustrators that are. You know, she, she's living in the Carson Ellis kind of world. Maybe she was influenced mm -hmm. by even Carson Ellis or vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, but it's that it's that kind of world. And, um, you know, there's some people that I'm seeing now on Instagram on my feed that I can't tell the difference. I always think it's Julia Sarda and then mm -hmm. it's somebody else. <laughs> so, yeah, I would say one know. of the things that that to me that is is the biggest difference is just good design. And by that, I mean, her value patterns, Sarda's value patterns are are so legible and so graphic and so um, well thought out and She's well planned. Awesome. And Sam's work is is really good. And, and in some places it's like, wow, that's really s striking. Um, but then the, a lot of the images are falling apart design-wise where I would go in and make different decisions. I'm sure you guys would make some different decisions. So it, it really comes down to, um, for me, um, that and, mm -hmm. and then there's some pieces in there that stylistically don't really seem to match so the style is kind of all over the place that one with the three kids there uh right there yeah i think that's one of her best pieces that's really nice it's really nice these um, ones stick out like a sore thumb compared yeah, to the so, other and and right now we're on you know if you want to see what we're looking at we're on youtube at society of visual storytelling uh channel oh. Or school and, uh, of visual storytelling, depending on school of visual <laughs> storytelling, society of visual storytelling. Um, we understand this is a podcast, and so most of you are probably not seeing what this we're seeing, really but you cool. can look it up on your own too. Um, but yeah, I get what you're. I totally get what you're saying, and that was my initial thing. Was like that's an awful lot of black for someone who wants to get into children's books, and usually um, uh, children's book illustrators or or publishers are wanting to do things that are a little bit more light, a little bit more airy, a little bit more um, uh, colorful. And this is probably a bogus reason, but that's a lot of ink you got to pay for when you're printing a book. If it's, yeah. <laughs> if it's that's not black. a reason, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that it's, it's a crutch in, in, in place of either being able to use color well, or being able to use design well, um, and there's so many artists that have used black. It's just, it's just like I said, it's a really advanced thing to do. Um, there's two things that I always tell our advanced artists in like advanced illustration classes and stuff. It's how to use black, super advanced thing to do. And then also to paint subject matter in all shadow where there's no light falling on the main subject like John Singer Sargent did mm -hmm. so many times so well. It is really tough to pull that off. And you got to be a pro to understand how to control value in, a, in an all shadow scene. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so the opposite of that is true. If they're, if they're a beginner illustrator or mid-level illustrator, I say have light falling across your subject. It's way easier to paint mm -hmm. than having everything in shadow. But anyway, so the ability to use black as a design, it's not just in this designy kind of style either, by the way, I want to point that out. It's Julia, as Julia Sarda, um, Mark English did it fantastic as a landscape painter. He is black in an amazing way. 
So it's just an advanced thing to do, but just watch out for overusing it if you're if it's darkening your images without helping your image. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this stuff's yeah. great. Yeah, so, so you know, <coughs> another thing to keep in mind, I think this is this is a, <coughs> on a positive side on this, is that it is it's always easier once you're once you're good enough to to where a rep is willing to take you on then you're probably getting work is just it gets easier and easier mm -hmm. I don't, you know so so um y yeah you're in a frustrating place right now because you know you're you're doing good work you know and when yeah. you see when you see the improvement to where you've been, to where you're, what you're doing now, you're like, come on, I'm here. Hire me. How come would, nobody yeah. rep wants me? You know, like I'm, am I not good enough? Well, we're just not taking anybody else on right now. Oh, I want to, I want to get for some actionable, like, um, tasks right now to work on. Number one, I would, um, remove the bottom 10 pieces from your, mm -hmm. uh, portfolio site today and start working on replacing them with new pieces that you're going to start knocking out now with color. So you can still have these black ones on there, these really dark ones on there, but do ones that that um, they don't have to be colorful. They just 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 lean a little bit farther away from having so much saturated black in them, mm -hmm. and uh, and replace those ten with another ten. You know, set a goal to do one really nice piece either a week or a month depending on your schedule and uh and i think you'll start getting and then keep submitting too every time you have a new piece i would just if you already have a relationship with some of these uh, art directors just say hey just wanted to stay on your radar here's my latest you know hope you have a good day don't expect anything from them don't make it sound like you expect anything from them uh, just so that, that they remain you know uh, in touch so they see where where things are going, because I guarantee if an agency is like, wow, this this person, she's really uh, improving. I could see a trajectory here. They're more likely to take you on mm -hmm. um, than 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 not. So, all right. I, and I, I want to say uh, one more thing that's actual too is there. There's some pieces in the middle, the the little girl sitting with the dog, the mm -hmm. rabbits and the girl, the buzzards and the girl, the frog and I the girl. I think it's a coyote. Yeah, it's like a kind desert of, thing. Um, I I would um, I would replace those with with really narrative pieces, you know that where, I mean, I I would I would definitely replace them with um, pieces that look like they're a situation in a children's book or a, or in a a young adult story, you know. Mm -hmm. um, th those those seem more fine arty to me that there's mm -hmm. it's, it's not like we can really see much story going on i think you really need to if you want to illustrate stories you've got to illustrate stories mm -hmm. what's cool is that she has wizard of oz on there and uh everybody's familiar with wizard of oz and so she's got a pretty darn unique take on it um so an art director could see that and be like, oh, okay, I understand this concept for a story that I have, what this person might do to it if this is what they've done to Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's that's really smart to have that. Yeah. Um, all right. Should we should we do the next one? Let's do the next one. Okay, this comes in from Nadia titled Multiple Account Disaster. She sent us like a uh a, quite a length, lengthy like backstory and long story short is she has two different accounts, one for more personal work and one for more, um, uh, she says one that's a little bit more sketchy, cartoony, um, following her heart type of account. And then her side account, she's got a fake name that she never shares anything personal, any personal information on it. Okay. The problem is this. If I'm hired for my side accounts portfolio, which is growing to be more and more noteworthy every day, do I have to share my legal name? Um, I've never gotten a commercial commission or job, so I'm not familiar with how much of my information would be shared. Assuming the answer is yes, and I ask them to call me by my fake name as a nickname, would they respect and use that? If that is the case, 
What I think I will do is go by my nickname on my main account as well. That way no one would recognize my name down the road and link the two accounts together. I just wish I didn't have to be so, it didn't have to be so complicated so I could use my name on my professional portfolio. Uh, she wants to address it now so it doesn't snowball into anything bigger later, but uh, she's, she's curious. So yeah, imagine this, you've got your personal account. It's got your name on there. It's got like your dinner that you had last night. It's got your pet, shares your location. Then you have the secret site account, fake name, different art style, all that stuff. And that's getting attention. What do you, what do you do? Do you, if you get a, a, a book deal or a commission or a sponsorship, they're going to have to pay you somehow. And, and usually banks use legal names, usually, um, um, you know, any sort of money exchange or contract happens with legal names. So I don't see you, um, if you really want to protect your privacy, maybe what you could do is set up an LLC. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. And just say, hey, I'm doing business as this LLC. So any sort of uh, deal would be, be with the LLC. And it would have its own like private PO box, so not a personal address or anything. Mm-hmm. And and you would set up the bank account with the LLC. And you would use an EIN number instead of a social security number. Right. So there's some there's some there's some hoops to jump through yeah. legally to do to set this up. Well, it's kind of a headache to do it's that. A it's real not headache. hard. The other thing is someone would have to sign. So there'd have to be an officer that would sign because when you get a contract, they're gonna want a signature and they're going to want it from you because mm-hmm. they're, because they're used to working with people directly who mm-hmm. use their, their real name. So there, but there would be definitely legal ways to, to, for them to work with a business instead of a person. It's just going to be more difficult along the way. Here's Not what too I think. difficult though. Every business that has a name that isn't your, their own name, which is most businesses have right. to do the yeah. same thing. It's right. just yeah. one of those things. I think I think the play for this would be um, sort of trusting the sponsor that you're dealing with or the, the business that you're dealing with to keeping mm-hmm. your personal information private. Yeah. But then any sort of um, uh, outward facing um communication having to do with this would be your online persona. Right? Yeah. See, and I know someone who had a bad relationship and this person um, had to get a restraining order mm-hmm. against her former um, boyfriend. Mm-hmm. And anyway, um, this person was worried about, you know, being found by this guy. Yeah. And that, so if, if I'm, I'm thinking of it from that, aspect right there that if that were the case if that was a reason to try to remain anonymous like what you said jake that the the thing would be to to just work with the company and just say anything that goes out needs to be under my pseudonym Mm -hmm. you know that you know this artwork done by pseudonym and then that person that the 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 boyfriend wouldn't be able to hunt back right. through that I channel mean, it's just, a, it's just yeah. a, pin, a pin a pin name i mean a yeah. lot of yeah. people use it it's not that not that big of a deal yeah so and then i would also change your other personal account to um if you want to start sharing personal things change the name but i would separate the two and never like draw any attention between the two never cross post anything between them uh, to keep your to keep your privacy so it's an interesting issue that we have to deal with now with identity theft and all this stuff. It's so complicated and scary. Yeah. I've never had it happen, but almost everybody I know has had something happen fraudulent, mm. you know? Yeah. I have a, this crazy idea. Uh, and I told it to Lee once on the phone and he's like, yeah, that is crazy. <laughs> but I don't, I don't want to share it on the podcast. Cause, uh, well, thanks for I teasing might, it. I still might do it. I still <laughs> okay. might do it. Okay, I don't remember what it is now, but I'm it, curious again. It 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 involves having um, an artist account, but the artist remains completely private. You have no idea who the artist is. 
Um, so like a Banksy illustrator kind of a person. Yeah, something like that. Uh, fine, I'll just tell it, you guys. Now, now, <laughs> now people who, now if I ever do this, people will know. No, the idea is that you have an artist who's disguised, like, um, you know, always wears a mask. Like, mm-hmm. uh, kind of like a that, uh, like that magician that was on Fox giving out oh, the yeah. and stuff. Yeah, or okay. or like a, a daft punky type of thing where every time they're in public, they're wearing their robot mask or something like that. And then essentially it could be a, a collective to where you sign up, you know, five, you get like a group of five different artists all across the world to be this artist. And then they all do shows wearing the mask and and nobody has to travel anywhere farther than than where they're at you know uh, they go to they go to the you know the the british um san diego comic con the, the the uk version of that they go to the europe version of that they go right. to the san diego version of that the only discrepancy there is like why why were they 6 7 at the london show and now they're <laughs> 5 feet tall at the- 5 feet tall and 300 pounds <laughs> <laughs> at the san diego show <laughs> It's weird. Just weird how that works. It's gravity works in different ways in well, different like, places. Uh, didn't Blue Man do that? I mean, they had like yeah. more than one Blue Man group. I mean, it's it, this isn't without precedent, right? And and isn't the common sort of knowledge on Banksy is that it's it's not one person, but it's like a a group or something like that. Is elves. that true? Yeah, I he has know. elves. Like like Andy. You know, Wall. you've made it as an artist when you have elves. Yes. The space elves. All right, next one. <laughs> All right, this comes from Michael titled, Is my art director doing it right? Hi, Jake Lee and Will. I always think it's interesting what order they put our names in. You know, sometimes it's Will Lee Jake, sometimes it's Lee Jake Will. It's a value statement. Yeah. We oh, yeah. They say they save the best for last always, I no. think. Is, no. <laughs> best first. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> First, wanted to say that 3PP is my favorite podcast. So I so appreciate you guys sharing your knowledge and love that you guys are weekly now. Oh, that's nice to know. <laughs> it makes we, we were debating whether or not to stay weekly or not. Who knows? It makes drawing by myself all day feel like I'm hanging out with these with three super cool professionals. All right, that's cool. And we love hanging out with you for sure. Um, I'm currently working on my first picture book with a smaller publisher. I'm super excited about getting this gig and being published, but I've had some difficulties working with the art director. Um, Without getting into all the details, the role of art director isn't actually this person's role at the company. The role kind of just landed on them. This has led to some confusion and miscommunication. It feels like I've had to explain how this illustration process process works for her, even though I hope she would have already known this. I know you guys did a uh, podcast a while ago about how to work with art directors, but could you please get into a little more detail about what an art director is actually supposed to do? And maybe give some examples of good notes from an art director versus when an art director is over art directing. Mm -hmm. What do you look for in a good art director? How do you determine a competent art director from an amateur one? Okay, what do you guys... That's a great question. Art director experiences. His his work is really good, by the way. Yeah, really good. It's really nice work. Um, and I, I, I need to double check and see if if he how much privacy he wanted to remain. Otherwise, I want to share share this artwork. But what do you guys think on the art director front? When's when is an art director overreaching? I, I think the best kind of art director can articulate. This is my dream art director where they articulate, they're not really talking about my art, but they're talking about how my art relates to the story or whatever I'm, we're trying to show and saying, you know, is this the best way to show it? Or what if here's why I'm not responding in a way that I probably should on this page or with this text. And then they still are letting me solve it visually um, this that's person the best. doesn't exist, by the way. But it doesn't going. exist. But it doesn't. <laughs> I'm just saying. That after working with so I'm many kidding. art directors, that no, you're not. It's true. That's that's the rare 
suggestion. It could be, I mean, and an example of that would be like, oh, this page is supposed to be really scary, but you're, but the image doesn't feel as scary as it could. Is there a way to solve this? That would be perfect art direction, my, in my opinion, because they're not actually telling me how to draw it. They're just mm. saying, hey, the art doesn't work as, as well as it could. Um, the worst case scenario is when you get art direction that is a post-it note that says, uh, draw King over here and four, you know, butlers over here. And then there's a window here. Like they're basically, mm -hmm. they're drawing it just with notes. And then you just have to actually, you know, draw the thing, but right. they're the ones that are driving the whole show. Um, and so somewhere in between is typically where most art directors land. Um, and it's hard because they're all beholden to marketing groups. And sometimes you don't know that, uh, and the publisher too, and everybody's sort of weighing in. Um, I think a, a, a good art director too works with as few people as they can. Um, the problem that's happened in the past 10 years, in my opinion, is, is art direction by committee. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get in revision hell and they, mm -hmm. and they're revising everything because somebody doesn't like red and somebody thinks the, uh, the character should have bigger hands and, and mm -hmm. it's just completely random. I I have to say that my art director on the Bonaparte books was Nicole Gastingay and at, mm -hmm. at Penguin Random House and she was amazing. Um, and one one of the reasons why I say that is because I think a, a great art director. By, by the way, I agree with everything you said, Lee. So I'm adding to it. Okay. Um, but a, a good art director, yeah, does what you said, which is will will tell you what they're not getting from what you sent in and yes, allow you to fix it. But also um, with, with, with her, I could tell right away that she did not allow herself to have a vision of what it was supposed to look like. Right. Because, mm -hmm. it, and we've talked about this before. If, if the three of us were given the same assignment, we would come up with three totally different books. If we, if we all had this, the same manuscript, right. Mm -hmm. And they, they could, each individually stand on their own as a great way to do it. It's, it's like one of those times where you, when you find out um, the stars who were up for a movie role that didn't mm -hmm. get it. And you're like, Hmm, I really like what so-and-so did, but man, I would really love to see what, how that other actor right. would have, would have done it. Um, and, and so what, one of the things that, uh, that she did not do was ever look at my, my drawings and, and make me feel like, well, that's not what I had in mind at all. You know, she didn't have anything in mind. She fully allowed me to visualize what this thing was going to look like. And then they worked from there. There, there were a few images where, um, content wise, she was like, um, you know, I, I feel like we're not showing enough of this or we're not, conveying enough of this part of the story. I wonder if we break these into two illustrations and you can focus more on this text on this one and more of this text on the other one, things like that. But then I would be able to go back. Um, but yeah, you're right. The, the, the worst art directing experiences. And I just finished a job like this for a hospital was designed by committee and I knew it going in. And I even told the art director who had to keep getting back to me, Hey, because she was apologizing constantly, like we got some more changes. Um, <laughs> and, and I, and I said, Hey, I just want you to know, I know this is that you're dealing with a committee and that it's not, you're just bringing me what they're saying. So you don't have to apologize. It's, it's totally okay. And, um, um, but yeah, th th those are the worst situations. And when you get into, when you get better jobs, you typically don't run into that as much. You, you get mm -hmm. better art directors that, realize it's not about what what their vision is it's about your vision and how they can best help you be successful with your vision yeah yeah you that last thing you brought up too it's like this is a uh michael's working for a small publisher they're kind of ship things around someone might be an experience that he's working with and that's that's part of the gig uh when you work working when you're you know, kind of working your way up the ranks and, uh, and getting to, to bigger and better things. I would say, uh, um, the role of the art director is to sort of extract the, your vision of the book 
out of view and make sure it, it matches with the vision of what the publisher wants for the book. And, uh, and you're hired for a reason. I obviously liked your, your work. They saw something in there that they knew you'd be able to bring to it. And, and it's just a matter of, you know, them kind of massaging what you're doing into the thing that they were expecting for this book. So, mm-hmm. um, if you go way, uh, way off track, the art director is supposed to like say, no, 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 not like that, like this. And if you're, if you're really doing a good job, the art director is just going to, you know, not do much at all. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. they're just going to make sure you, you stay motivated and stay on track and, and stay on time. So um, if you know you're working with a new art director though, I want to offer some advice or if you're, if you're working for smaller publishers and people that just aren't that experienced, the more you can submit um, the reasoning behind your vision and why Mm -hmm. you're making the choices you are, the easier it is for them. Cause they basically Mm -hmm. just need to go tell people, Hey, here's why this looks the way that it does. Here's what the artist says. And and that has proved that has paid dividends for me when I learned that, that I don't just submit a sketch. I say, Here's the sketch. Here's what I was going for for this sketch. Here's three keywords for this sketch. Here's why I included the things in the sketch because it, it you know, hits this note or that note. And man, it's just providing them with ammo to sit because they're not gonna unless they have a crazy ego, they're not gonna fight that. They're just gonna say, "Oh, this guy knows what he's doing." I, right. I don't, you know, it's more than I can say. And then he then he presents that to the committee. Hey, here's why the artist made these choices, and then it goes through. Uh, with much less hassle. I don't want to say mm-hmm. there's no hassle, but it goes through with much less. Mm-hmm. That's and, good. And, it, and another piece of advice is to stay as, as put as little value into your sketches in the early rounds as you can and still convey your ideas. And like I've said many times on this podcast before, I, I try to get to know my, my art director and say, hey, can I just submit some really rough sketches to you only. Please don't share them to the team. And just, I want to see if if this is looking like it's going to work before I invest more time in it. I, that way it's, I can change, you know, I can take any suggestions you have now before I put more value into it, more time. The, the more time you put into it, the less enthusiastic you're going to be to make complete, you know, huge sweeping changes. Hey, let me, let me add to this. Cause this is a topic that just came up and I've got a graphic for it. Jake, can you give me a screen sharing mm-hmm. privileges? Let's invite Sharon screen to this meeting. Sharon screen just shows up. Hold on. <laughs> let me, uh, let me open it up. Um, I was just having a critique with a student yesterday about this exact issue. And so it's a good one. Um, my advice to her was because she, her, her concern was she's investing so much time in, into a dummy that when it came time to actually critique the dummy, she was almost uh, out of gas because <laughs> she had spent so much time. She doesn't want to mm-hmm. change it all. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, Who would want to change something that they've spent hours and hours and hours and hours and hours working on? Right, right, exactly. And my my um, pitch to her was, let's see if I can find this thing. Um, my pitch to her was what you want to have is three levels of – uh, three levels of thumbnail and those three, those three levels. Oh, here it is. I found it. Those three levels are level one is really just a storyboard. Um, mm-hmm. it's loose as it can be. It takes two seconds to, mm-hmm. to, to draw it and paint it up. And, um, and it's, it's just really fast. You could do yeah, no more than, no more than three to five minutes on each one of those. And it's really, really loose. Um, the next one would be. Now are the, you, you haven't shared by the way. I haven't shared because I have, okay. I'm, I'm, Looking for the dang thing. Hold on one second. I know I got it here somewhere. Cause oh here it is. I got it. All right. So I am sharing. If you see this on the YouTube, I will share. It. I'll share it in the show notes too. If anybody anybody wants to see it. Um, but the second level is the sweet spot thumbnail or sweet spot sketch, in my opinion. Um, here, let me share it now. Finally. All right, so I got my level one here in the lower left. These are ones you can bang out. They're almost Pictionary level, if that's an can be a good description of how mm-hmm. loose these things are. There's mm-hmm. the scale is all wrong. The you know it's just sort of what's in it. Like there's a whale in one and a mermaid swimming around. I, that wouldn't be the way the image actually looks in the end. But it's uh, it's enough to say, hey, there's a whale and a mermaid on the page. That's my mm-hmm. intent for that level one one. Then the second one. Um, I have one that's borderline on this level and one that I think is hits this sweet spot where they're, they're 
probably eight to 15 minute sketches at most. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can tell it, it is starting to get into what the actual composition is, what the character, not necessarily what the characters look like, um, but the space they occupy in, in the image. Um, so it's a pretty good representation. As a matter of fact, if I were to show, um, the finished painting of this, it is almost exact to what this sketch is. Mm -hmm. And the sketch took me 10 minutes. I'm not locked into it. I have one sketch above this one that is almost to that level, but it's just doesn't have the level of detail. So I would probably need to spend a little bit more time. And then on the, the third level sketch, so, so there's the, the middle one is that sweet spot sketch where you're not spending a lot of time, but you're getting a lot of value out of it. And then the third one is a finished sketch. And that's the one at the end that you present and saying, okay, this is the sort of the finished version of the sketch phase and mm -hmm. everybody signs off on it. And, and you don't have to go. The problem is everybody goes to this level three way too early. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. so now the art direction is tough because, you know, the, the it, you know, it takes a long time to do these sketches or not, not a long time, but more time than you want to spend. And then you don't want to change them like I was talking about yesterday. So just understanding these three levels of sketches can speed you up immensely because you can say, hey, I'm, in I'm just doing level one right now in the beginning. They're loose. The art director is probably not going to see that. Or like in the case of what Will's saying, you've worked with the art director before and you can submit that level one sketch. Man, you can burn through a mm -hmm. bunch of sketches and really get to the heart of it. Mm -hmm. I love or working doing, that way. On the, yeah, me, me too. The too loose and just staying there trying to figure out my, um, my pagination mm -hmm. on the book and bringing the art director in to help me figure out that as well. Yeah. And, yeah. um, they, they, I've worked with a bunch of art directors that way that love that. They're like, Oh yeah, let me see what you, what you're working on. Work in progress. <laughs> yeah. But don't show this to the team. You know, it's not ready <laughs> yeah. for them. Don't want to yeah. scare them off. Yeah. Sometimes those sketches are so loose. I have to actually write in text what it is next to it. Like mm -hmm. this is a cornfield or this is a baseball right. stadium or, <laughs> you know, it's just a <laughs> well, big you're mark. right. You're playing Pictionary and, and Pictionary has a very low, value when you're done with it you know right like no one saves their pictionary drawings right right exactly <laughs> it's just the minimal minimal amount of information right. to for you to know that that's big ben or, it took or, me mm -hmm. it took me 15 to 20 years as an illustrator to to learn not to you know not to beautify over, stuff overdraw yeah. yeah not to not to put value into things until until we're ready, until it's time. It's right. like, I love, I, I love making art so much that I would just get into it and I'd start dreaming that, well, the art director's going to see the value in this and they're, of course they're going to accept it because it's, it's so nice. It's so great. Right. And then they go, you know, we got to change that one. Yeah. And I'm like, it's like butt hurt and everything, you know, painting, <laughs> painting the two by fours before the framing's even done on the house. Right. Right. Because like, right. I love to paint. Oh, <laughs> You know what? Yeah. Well, that's why, I mean, if it, and you can, you can tell which phase of sketch that you're stuck in. If it, like when I was talking to this artist yesterday and doing the critique, I said, you know, I want you to set a timer and try to live in this level two sketch or level one sketch. Don't go over 15 minutes, set a timer. And that was going to be extremely hard for her. She hasn't really done that that much. And so that's a signal that you don't have that level two Mm -hmm. abilities guys should not go over 15 minutes you need to bang through be able to bang through these things otherwise you're being too precious yeah. and it actually hurts the art direction too because you're kind of i i told her my analogy yesterday was i want to know there's a truck in the scene i don't want to know that it's a ford f-150 right mm -hmm. exactly so just so. just to give people an idea like when i when i start working on a children's book in the the, the in one day i can um take all the i take I make a layout. I do it in in on my iPad in Procreate, but I'll 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 put all the images, you know, kind of like your thumbnail layout that you've got in the Children's Book Pro class, you know, and with the text and just do chicken scratch Pictionary on all the pages on a different layer, right? Trying to fool around with what set what feels right, and I'll do and then I'll go back and revisit that the next day and the next day. But moving things around, changing things, and just staying in that Pictionary mode as long as possible to yeah. figure out, is the book working? And I feel like people don't, don't do that enough. Beginning it's true. It's so. true. So you may, it may seem like we wandered off topic, but it really how you present your work and how you work really does affect how the art director handles what you're doing. Yeah. So it is related in that yeah. way. 
Do you guys, um, we did our three questions. We still have a little more time to, to finish out an hour. Do you want to talk about meeting with that student yesterday about style, Lee? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I don't have to get too specific um, with the style. But it, but it, was, it was kind of a back and forth that we had talking about it. Like, can can you, if your style is a little dated, but good, can you get work as an illustrator right now? Like, right, right. And we, yeah, we talked about ways to analyze the work because it's super, super solid in terms of technique. I mean, drawing level better can draw better than me. That's for sure. Um, mm-hmm. that's not, that's not saying much. Um, but she, <laughs> she's, she's really good. And, uh, and yet it had a look of the golden age books of, of illustration, like Arthur Rackham and, and like this kind of, era, you know, that era, and the thing is, it didn't look like it was a modern interpretation of that. It looked literally mm-hmm. like it was from that era. And mm-hmm. I thought that I was asking Jake and 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 Will and, and David Hone as well, is that a problem? And and, and I, I couldn't really. I don't want to give art direction where somebody should be a style chaser. Right. Oh, you can't right. do that style. I'll do this other style that's not even you. Mm-hmm. But what? So what? How do you approach it? It was. I thought it was a super interesting thing to address. And and so what we talked about was why does it look like that? Why does it look like it's from that era? And so you start to question like, okay, what kind of media are you using? Okay. it looks like a traditional kind of look in terms of media. And then it gets into the, uh, art things like how's your composition working? Are you using pattern or texture? Um, you know, all that stuff leans into it looking, um, like it's from that era. And then the kind of story that you do, if it's from that era, well, now you've got every single ingredient. So like, I would Mm -hmm. say if you've got this, so that's what we talked about is like, if you've got one thing that points to that era, you have to change the other thing. So, you know, we looked at David, David Wiesner's like Tuesday, like he's got a very traditional look, but Mm -hmm. that does not, his work does not look like it's from that time period, the 1930s, 1920s. It does not, it looks, it looks new because he changed the subject matter, mm, right? Now, if yeah. he did, if he did, if he painted Hansel and Gretel, it his, it stuff it might look like from that period, or if he painted one of these Little Red Riding Hood or something. Although he's um, got an unconventional drawing style, he does. I'm just saying, like, well, I mean, Chris Van Ellsberg is a great example of that too. Yeah. He's, he's he's very yeah. realistic, but it does. And Sean, even Sean Tan, like a very painterly kind of style, but he because he's got this painterly style how he is so modern is in what he draws. It's so bizarre. So he's got a traditional technique right. that he's then added uncommon um, subject matter. Right. That's but such a good take on this. Cause you look at um, Ben Allsberg and it's essentially let's do twilight zone children's books. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, each one of his stories is like a, a you know, another dimension type of experience where reality is turned upside down. But that works so much better because he draws so realistically. You know, mm-hmm. if if John Classen did the Polar Express, it would be it'd be way it'd be like too much sugar and candy, right? It'd right, be like right. it wouldn't it wouldn't be satisfying enough. But because you've got this very realistic thing and this kid, all of a sudden there's a train in front of his house, like it makes, it makes it seem more imaginative. So that, that's such a good note on this. Yeah. It was interesting because I had a similar critique, although my, the critique for my work was the opposite. And it was so interesting. Mm -hmm. I had it when I was in school, um, when I was just starting to play with Bendy for a while, like I have kind of a, uh, uh, definitely not traditional um, perspective, but when I first started exploring, leaving traditional perspective behind, everything was bendy, almost think Mm -hmm. of like Looney, Looney tunes or something Mm -hmm. like that. I just didn't know what I was doing. Um, but I was like, Oh, I can make the shapes anything I want to, you know, and everything's bendy and you know, all over the place. And then on top of that, I was doing very weird subject matter that was uncommon too. And so the, I had a teacher and, and, and I just wasn't getting a response from it that I wanted. And the yeah. teacher pulled me, pulled me aside and said, look, if you're going to do a really weird world, it would probably benefit you to do a very straightforward story, like mm-hmm. in terms mm-hmm. of subject matter and what you're drawing. And that way, because right now you, everything's bendy and in the art style and then the subject matter is wacky. So nobody can identify with what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Right. 
So it's yeah. a push and a pull. Uh, um, and so if you're really traditional with your, with your technique, you want to be more creative with the subject matter and, and vice versa. And, and it was great advice because then mm. I started really dialing back what I was doing. If the art was technique was being pushed so far, perspectives were all wacky and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if I did have one where I needed to be a little more traditional, that means my subject matter could change a little more. So you got to look at each element independently and saying, is this working for this story uh, or, and, and my style together and, and, and what needs to change? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, should we wrap it up? Let's put Let's a bow on it. Okay. Everybody, thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective is made possible by svslearn.com, where becoming a great illustrator starts. Your hosts today have been Will Terry, uh, Lee White, and Jake Parker. You can find Will Terry's work on willterry.com, Lee White at leewhiteillustration.com, and uh, I'm Jake Parker at mrjakeparker.com. Podcast produced by Daniel Tu. That's danieltu.co is his website, danieltu.co. Special thanks to Master Production, David Bro, Keeper of the Curriculum, Austin Shirtliff, Chief Operations Officer, Lisa Fott. And a thank you to Lily Howell for our show notes. Now, go draw something. We should get go draw something t-shirts. Yeah, with a finger pointing. That's not bad. Thing. It's actually not a bad idea. I should have worn the... I think the, it should be simplified to now go draw. Go or draw. Or just go, go, draw. go draw. Go draw. Go draw. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's the new outro. Now, now go. Go, go draw. draw. Now. That's good stuff, man. Go draw. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the best episode of Survivor, or the best season is when the that middle I can't remember his name the middle school teacher the old guy okay made the fake idol mm -hmm. and it was the first oh. fake immunity idol ever on the show and he was grabbing beads from like challenges and stuffing them in his pocket <laughs> like just grabbing things <laughs> so, to, smart. so it looked official and then um there was a dude that was gunning for him but he convinced everyone to tell the guy that like he would save him instead like because mm -hmm. they were gunning for him too. Mm -hmm. And they're like, he'll give you the, his idol. And so he's mm. like, I'll take his idol and then I'll send him home the next time kind of a thing. Yeah. And so he's in tribal council and, and Jeff Probst, I love it. He's like, the rules state that when an immunity idol is played, that person cannot be sent home. This, however, <laughs> is not... An immunity idol. <laughs> it's a fake one. <laughs> it was dagger. So he makes a fake one, gives it yeah. to this guy for in exchange for like protection. Yeah. And 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 the guy wanted everyone to vote for him so his vote their votes wouldn't count. And mm. then it would bounce off onto the next guy, mm -hmm. which right. would be the teacher that gave him the mm. you see what I'm saying? Like he yeah, was yeah, yeah. Smart. A double cross. That's 3D chess. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Well, it's a lot of people must have taken I haven't seen a ton of Survivor, but the episode the season that we're watching, uh, they're down to the, the final five. And the girl, a girl made the fake idol and tried to do something like that. It didn't really work that well. Oh. Um, but there, she made the fake idol. People are used to looking for them now. Yeah. It's a thing. <laughs> so out of everybody I know, I and I don't think you've realized this, Lee, but you are like a prime candidate to be on Survivor. Yeah, you could do good. I think you should you think? do it. Except yeah, I would here's, love to do, do it. Do you want to know how to make the, the final, um, the second half through the first half? Is the first, you, you could, he, could he, before we get there, could he actually get picked? Do you think? I don't, I don't know. Because they, they fill slots. They want the stupid person. They want, they, the, got that. They, want, they want the good looking person, <laughs> the good looking smart athlete. They want the person that's like chaos. So chaos is a, is a, um, a trait they're looking for of someone that's just going to annoy everyone. I would, I would love to be in that role. No, you, they never win. Chaos doesn't win, but you could, but um, no, the way to make it to the second half is basically work hard and don't say anything and don't take any leadership roles. Right. You don't mm. want to be the weakest and you don't want to be the strongest. Yeah. That's kind yeah. of the role. Yeah. You just I've work seen. hard and, and just hold, bite your tongue and just listen. And you have to make an alliance. You know, you have to be, you have to be loyal. And okay, so it. out of us three, who would win Survivor? Uh, not in your me. opinion, Will. Not me. I'll just so take myself right now. So it's down between me and Lee. Yeah. 
I'd say, uh, sorry, Lee, but I think Jake might have a better chance. <laughs> nah, J- J- Jake would play it too straight and people would see him as a threat and vote him off. Cause that's, that's the thing. Is like, if I one of the that. challenges was pickleball, racquetball or frolf. See, I would win all the, it. I would win the majority of challenges. I'd be immune most of the time. <laughs> But I am great at, ca- at at getting chaos to happen mm-hmm. in a subtle way, and so I think I, I think I would be actually pretty good at the game, because I love I love that kind of stuff. Like I love you games would, that involve be, that. Yeah, but you'd, you'd be, be amazing you'd, at it. You'd be greedy. You'd go off and look for the idol on, when you're trying to go to the bathroom. You'd sneak off, and then the people would they always get caught. They're, they're like he's he's looking for the idol, and then they they don't know if I you have it, so they they you're a threat, so they have to send you home. What's so dumb about that is it's a game where the where where it's this huge bonus thing, and then you get dinged for looking for it. I would tell yeah. people right there and while we're sitting there, guys, I'm going to try to find this idol, and you should too. And I'll that way, it, sent de- home. it demystifies. But now he's a leader. It. Now you become a leader. Just yeah. saying, everybody wants it. Let's let's just let's just put it out on the table. If the episode is about you, like in other words, if they give you more screen time, <laughs> that's a trying. sign you're going home. <laughs> <laughs> now Emerson is interested in it. He says he would like to do it. I would like to do it. Um, did you guys ever hear about that software program? There's a, there was a uh, software program in the early days of computing where they were trying to figure out how humanity survives, and they were trying to uh, basically it was a contest, and you write the rules of how your civilization works, and they run it through a program and see mm. how well your civilization did. And it was oh, just interesting, interesting on the most basic line of computer code was basically when two entities interact, it's uh, uh, benign or or slightly beneficial. And then if one of them burns the other one, they cut that person off. And so you give people basically the benefit of the doubt on the first one. You behave in a, in mm. a mutually beneficial way. And then... Uh, and at that that one beat all the other programs that are super complicated and had all these social rules and all that stuff. It's basically be nice until somebody burns you, and then don't be nice. And um, oh, interesting. It's, it's an interesting kind of dynamic, right? So turn the other cheek, but don't so turn the other other cheek. That's why you guys have noticed that I'm always nice to you guys. <laughs> uh, I see what's going to happen here. <laughs> Do not make enemies with Will Terry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking of speaking of Survivor, I think we should do another group, uh, just us three, in in some city or location, like we did last yeah. year in Arizona. I think it would yeah. be good right now, especially as we're kind of retooling. Yeah. Well, I mean, we did it last August, and so that's it's coming up in a couple months. Yep. Maybe we do it in. It's hot where you guys are. It's not hot where I am. We could go up to I'd, the mountains. Too. Colorado would be awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, should we do? Should we record? I Let's mean, should it. we do this episode? Let's do it. Let's do it.